Well, tonight we're in Acts chapter 20, and tonight we're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 16, and we are on Paul's third missionary journey, and actually we're coming to the conclusion of Paul's third missionary journey. This is the last section, and it's entitled, A Journey to Jerusalem, and that's where Paul is headed. And he's already said in chapter 19, after being in Ephesus for three years, that his primary goal is to go to Jerusalem and then go to Rome. And the rest of the book is really about those two cities, uh, both getting there and what happens to Paul once he gets there. And right now, Paul has begun that journey uh, to Rome. He's going to leave Ephesus after three years, and his next goal in mind is, I must make it to Jerusalem. And he has an objective in doing that. So in this journey section, uh, Paul's going to do uh, five things. He's going to revisit some of those churches in Macedonia. Uh, he's collecting money for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. So these Gentile churches are going to give money for the Jewish church in uh, Jerusalem. So Paul's going to go back to make that collection. Uh, he's also going to have a rather strange ministry in Troas. It's a story of tragedy and comedy at the same time. And we're going to look at that tonight. Eventually, he makes it to Miletus, uh, which is one of the places he wanted to go. And once he gets to Miletus, which is 30 miles from Ephesus, he wants to have one last conversation with the church leaders from Ephesus. So he invites them to make that 30-mile journey so that he can talk to them one last time. And then the last part of this journey is that several people are going to say to Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, bad things are going to happen to you. So just don't go, and you'll be fine. And of course, we know how stubborn Paul is. So he's going to have to deal with that, with all of his friends telling him not to do something that he has his heart set on doing. Maybe you've been there before in life. Uh, but that's what Paul is going to experience in this last section. Well, the first section of the last section is Paul's final ministry to churches in Macedonia. And that's in chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And what I want to do is read those six verses, and then we'll go back and talk about them uh, one at a time. So Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months because the Jews made a plot against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Der Derbe, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread and five days later joined the others at Troas where we stayed seven days. So this is Paul's final mission uh, to the churches in Macedonia. And it begins by saying when the uproar had ended. And that was the uproar we talked about last week. Uh, that was in the uh, outside arena at uh, Ephesus, where the silversmiths had brought charges against Paul. Uh, basically, they were angry at Paul because Christians weren't buying their statues and they were losing money. And he basically accused Paul of speaking against the great Art Artemis, who was the goddess of Ephesus. And they get in the arena and everybody's yelling and finally the city clerk quiets everybody down, basically says the Christians haven't committed any crime, uh, so if you want to try to press charges against them, you do that in court, uh, not uh, in this area. And basically, after that, everybody leaves and goes home. So finally, when that uproar had ended, 
Paul sent for the disciples, and by disciples, he's not referring to the original 12. Uh, he's talking about to Christians there in Ephesus. He encourages them, he says goodbye, and he sets out for Macedonia. It's at this point that we realize that Luke doesn't record everything about Paul's story. Uh, it could be that Luke doesn't know everything that happened to Paul. Uh, we're going to find out tonight that most likely Luke is in Philippi, where he meets up with Paul again. So a lot of what Paul did on this missionary journey, uh, Luke never hears about. Uh, Luke only finds out about when he asked Paul about the stories that took place, and whatever Paul decided to share is what Luke recorded. Also, Luke is writing uh, with a theme in mind, with an agenda in mind, and some things that happen to Paul just don't fit the theme, they don't fit the agenda, so there's no reason to include them in the book of Acts. In other words, Luke doesn't record everything that Paul did. He's very selective in what he records. And at this point, Luke leaves out some big information that Paul talks about in the book of 2 Corinthians chapters 1 through 7. And it's at this point that Paul's relationship with the church at Corinth gets rather strained. It was, Paul spends three years in Ephesus. During his final year in Ephesus, Luke doesn't record this, but Paul makes a journey to Corinth. And that journey to Corinth and the time he spends in Corinth turn out badly. Paul meets up with some opposition, and Paul has what he calls in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, a painful visit. So Paul visits the church in Corinth, and things don't go well at all. He runs into people who oppose him, and things get rather nasty. So Paul returns to Ephesus, and he writes a letter back to the church at Corinth. And scholars have termed this letter a severe letter. Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, as a painful letter written with many tears. And basically, this is a confrontational letter where Paul confronts the Corinthian church and tells them to get their act together. Uh, there's some things going on in Corinth that are wrong, and the leaders of the church need to step up and correct the wrong that is taking place. Well, what's going on in Corinth? Well, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you know the church at Corinth has lots of problems. In fact, it seems that when you read 1 Corinthians, they don't get anything right. And one of the things they argued about in Corinth, they argued over their favorite apostle or their favorite evangelist, their favorite missionary. And Paul talks in 1 Corinthians that some liked Simon Peter. He was one of Jesus' original 12. Uh, he was able to tell them stories about Jesus. So they really liked him. Uh, Apollos also had made his way into Corinth. And Apollos was just a dynamic speaker. And the people just loved hearing him talk. And so many people liked Apollos. Well, Paul founded the church in Corinth. And you can read about that. We actually studied that in Acts chapter 18. Uh, Paul actually founded the church on a missionary journey. And so a lot of the people loved Paul. And then there was a fourth group that basically said, I'm not following Paul, Apollos, or Simon Peter. I'm following Jesus. So there was this great division in the church. And because of that, there was a group of people apparently led by one man who questioned whether or not Paul was an apostle. I mean, Simon Peter had been to town. Simon Peter had been with Jesus during those three and a half years of ministry. Paul had not. Uh, of course, Paul had the great story of what took place when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, but Paul had not been with Jesus 
during his earthly ministry. So there were a lot of people in Corinth saying, Paul's not a true apostle. Peter is, but Paul is not. So we don't have to listen to Paul because he's not a true apostle. And so while all of this controversy is going on, Paul shows up and he meets this opposition group head on. And there's a lot of conflict and a lot of tension. And then Paul comes back and writes the letter, basically telling the church leaders, you need to solve this problem. Uh, you need to make this right. Uh, in fact, Paul basically said, I am your apostle because I founded the church and God has called me into the ministry to be an apostle. And so Paul challenges them to make this right. And at that point, we pick up with Acts chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, that's the time frame. So Luke doesn't tell us anything about the little trip to Corinth that went bad. He doesn't tell us anything about the letter that Paul sent. And Paul sent that letter with Titus. Uh, Titus delivered the letter. And Titus' assignment was to remain there in Corinth until after they read it and decide what to do. And then Titus was to come back to Paul and tell him what they decided. Paul would like to go to Corinth again, but he's not going to go if it's going to be a disaster like it was the previous time. So, Paul leaves Ephesus and he sets out for Macedonia and he ends up going to Troas. And while he's at Troas, he has an effective ministry. And on this map... Uh, Basically, Paul leaves Ephesus right there in the middle and goes up to Troas. And eventually, he's going to try to make his way into uh, Greece and Macedonia. Paul is hoping while he's at Troas ministering that Titus will show up and give him a report. But while at Troas, Titus never shows up. And eventually, Paul decides to leave and continue his journey into Macedonia, hoping again that he would run in to Titus. Can you imagine that in the first century? You know, just hoping to bump into somebody? You know how much easier that is today? You just send him a text. You know, that's a piece of cake. Uh, but back in the first century, communication was difficult, and so Paul is hoping to bump in to Titus. So Paul leaves Troas and makes his way to Philippi. And while he's at Philippi, Titus shows up. And fortunately, Titus has good news. The letter was well received by the church leadership. They have carried out discipline against those who are causing all the trouble. And the church is willing to reconcile with Paul. So it ends up being a good story uh, after Titus leaves. So at that moment, Paul decides, I need to write another letter uh, to the church at Corinth. And he's going to send it with Titus, who's going to go ahead of him. And eventually, Paul's going to leave Philippi and make his way to Corinth once again. So at that point, Paul writes another letter. It's the letter we call 2 Corinthians. Now, in reality, Paul writes four letters to this church. Uh, he writes an initial letter that we don't have. Uh, in fact, in what we call 1 Corinthians, Paul makes reference to an initial letter that he sent them. But we don't have it. Apparently, it got lost. Uh, the second letter that he writes is what we call 1 Corinthians. Then the third letter that Paul writes is what we just called tonight the severe letter, the confrontational letter. And then the fourth letter is 2 Corinthians. So Paul ends up writing them four times. We have two of those letters. Uh, we don't have the other two. Uh, I'm guessing that severe letter eventually got torn up uh, once things got reconciled. Uh, that was probably, probably not something they wanted to spread around the community. So chances are somebody tore that one up. 
So, Paul eventually decides, I'm going to Corinth. So, he travels from Philippi all the way to Corinth. And he's going to stay there for three months. While Paul is at Corinth, he writes the letter that we call Romans. Because remember, where does Paul want to go? He wants to go to Jerusalem and eventually to Rome. So Paul takes this opportunity while he's in Corinth, and chances are it's during the winter months, so he's not going anywhere anyway. And so he's kind of stuck there. It's probably A.D. about 55 to 56. Paul's not going anywhere, so it's a great opportunity to write a letter and send it ahead to Rome so that when Paul eventually arrives in Rome, they will know who he is and be expecting him. So, as we move on, it says Paul traveled through that area, meaning Macedonia, speaking many words of encouragement to the people. Now, Paul's major concern as he's making his way through Macedonia is to collect money for the Christians in Jerusalem. So these words of encouragement may have been words of encouragement to give uh, to the Christians in Jerusalem. So his goal is to make that collection and then leave Corinth and go to Jerusalem. And he wants to be there by Passover, if he can. So he finally arrives in Greece. Greece is Corinth. So that's where he ends up spending the three months. So he arrives in Greece, which is Corinth, where he stayed for three months. So things are working out. Uh, it was a disaster with the church at Corinth, but things have been reconciled. Paul goes there for three months. Uh, he stays at the home of a friend named Gaius, and it could be that same man called Titius Justus that we read about in Acts chapter 18, verse 7. And if you remember the story... Paul starts out in the synagogue. And things are going pretty well for a while until the Jews who decide not to accept Jesus get angry and they kick him out. And where does Paul go? Luke says he goes next door, meaning he didn't go very far at all. He moved next door to the home of Titius Justice and began proclaiming Christ from there. And that doesn't make the Jewish people very happy. I mean, you know, they kicked Paul out of the synagogue, but he didn't go very far. <laughs> kind of moved next door and set up shop there. So there's a lot of tension between the Jews at Corinth and Paul as well. And Luke only tells us part of that story. So he stays there for three months, and now that spring has arrived, it's time to go to Jerusalem but not so fast. It says, because of the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to go to Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. So let me show you on the map what Paul wanted to do. He wants to leave Corinth, and he wants to take a boat all the way to Syria, and chances are he'd end up in Tyre, and then he would make his way to Jerusalem. Uh, pretty much a direct route. Uh, and as long as there's good weather, which in the spring there normally was, he could simply go from Corinth all the way to Syria, to Jerusalem, and make it in pretty decent time for the Passover. But it's not going to work out that way. Somehow Paul learns that there is a plot against him. And the plot is carried out, or tried to be carried out, by some Jewish people. Uh, in the book of Acts, Paul's main opponents are Jews who don't believe in Jesus. Uh, they get very angry at Paul. And it's kind of ironic, because before Paul met Jesus, what was he like? He was a Jew who hated people who believed in Jesus and he wanted to get rid of them. But now Paul's one of those Jesus people and his fellow Jews who don't believe in Jesus want to get rid of him. And 
Paul somehow hears about this plot. Now, Luke doesn't tell us exactly what the plot is, and Luke doesn't tell us how Paul finds out about it, but Paul decides, I can't get on that boat, because not only would he get on that boat, but there's a lot of Jewish people in Corinth who would be on that same boat going to Jerusalem for Passover. And if Paul is on the boat, there's nowhere to hide. And if there's a plot against him, he could end up in the Mediterranean Sea before he ever makes it to Jerusalem. And not only that, he's carrying a lot of money with him at this point. Money that goes to the Christians in Jerusalem. And so Paul decides, I can't do that. So he changes plans at the last minute. And I think there's a great application here. Have you ever had some plans and they all just fell apart? You know, you had it all mapped out. You had this great strategy, but something happened and it just messed up your entire agenda. Uh, the application is we need to be flexible when making plans, because God may have other ideas. Uh, a lot of people have said, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans, because they don't always come true. God has other ideas in mind. Uh, we may, and it's fine to have plans. Paul always had some plans, but sometimes we have to be flexible with our plans. Uh, when I went on the mission trip to Belize, uh, one of the things we learned before we left was be flexible uh, because you just never know what's going to happen. In fact, I was told before I left and when I got there that I would be speaking on Sunday evening at the church service. Well, I arrive on Sunday morning thinking I'm just going to enjoy church today. Well, little did I know that communication got messed up, and I had to speak Sunday morning. And they called on me to give the message that day. And fortunately, I'd studied the night before. Uh, but wow, talk about having your plans messed up. Uh, so you have to be flexible. And the Christian life is often like that. Uh, we may have our plans, but God can have other plans, and God may change uh, those particular plans. Well, moving on to verse 4, we find out that Paul is accompanied by seven men. Uh, these seven men are representatives, delegates from the churches who gave money to Paul to be given to the Jews in Jerusalem. So not only did they take up an offering, they also sent a delegate, a representative from their church to go along with Paul, which made sense. Uh, even if there's not a plot against you, back in ancient times, you don't want to be carrying a lot of money by yourself. Uh, you could easily get attacked and you could lose all the money and possibly your life at the same time. But there's at least eight of them, if not more, who are traveling together. And so a large group of men is less likely to be attacked uh, than just one or two. Also, these men represent the different provinces where Paul had established churches, and some of those included um, uh, Sopater, Aristarchus, and Secundus are from the Macedonian churches, uh, Gaius and Timothy are from South Galatia, Tychicus and Trophimus are from Asia. So we have Macedonia, Asia, and South Galatia all represented and they're all going together with Paul to deliver this money uh, to the Christians in Jerusalem. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. So he's going to send some men from Corinth to Troas. And there's a question about who these men are. Did he send everybody? Or did he just send the two who happened to come from Asia? Uh, Troas is in Asia, and Tychicus and Trophimus are from that area. And it could be that he simply sent those two and said, you go on ahead, and when you get to Troas, find us a ship that will take us to Jerusalem. 
Uh, we'll join you, and then we'll get on the ship and make our journey to Jerusalem. And in the meantime, Paul backtracked. So let me look at this map again. Uh, Paul is in Corinth, and instead of taking the boat across the Mediterranean Sea, he sends at least two guys up to Troas. They could easily take a boat up to Troas and get uh, things ready for Paul when he arrives. But Paul decides to backtrack. So he goes from Corinth, probably takes a boat to Berea, and then walks to Thessalonica, Philippi, Neapolis, and eventually he'll get on a boat at Neapolis and end up in Troas. So again, he's got plan B uh, all worked out. He's going to send some men ahead, and he's going to join them. And it ends up being five days from Neapolis to Troas. And it's interesting, when he went the other way, when he began the missionary journey, the journey from Troas to Neapolis only took two days. He had a tailwind then. Now he runs into a headwind. Instead of two days, it's a five-day journey uh, to get there. So also something interesting that we find in verse 5 is the word us. Luke is the author of Acts. And there are times when Luke will use first-person pronouns. Uh, they're often called the we sections of the book of Acts. And whenever you see a first-person personal pronoun, you know that Luke is there on the scene. So as it turns out, while they're in Philippi, that's where they meet up with Luke once again. And in Philippi is where Paul celebrates the Passover. He wanted to be in Jerusalem. <laughs> he ends up in Philippi. And again, you've got to be flexible because you never know what's going to happen. The last time we met Luke was when Paul was in Philippi. There's a good possibility that when Paul left Philippi, which when he left the first time, he got escorted to the city line and said, get out of here. Uh, there's a possibility that Luke has stayed there the entire time. Uh, Paul knew he could not stay, but Luke could. And it's a good possibility that Luke continued to minister in Philippi uh, while Paul was on these other missionary journeys. But now that Paul is back in Philippi, Luke says, I'm coming with you. Wherever you're going, I'm going. And for the next several verses and chapters in Acts, it's very detailed. Why is it so detailed? Luke's there. And perhaps he's got, you know, pen and paper writing down what happens every step of the way. So Luke has now rejoined Paul. Verse 6. But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which it was Passover was the one day, then seven days the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas. And once they get to Troas, they're going to stay there for seven days. So again, they've made it from Philippi over to Troas in Asia, and that's where the next story is going to take place. The next story is in verses 7 through 12. Uh, let me read this story. It's a story of tragedy, and it's a story of comedy at the same time. So verse 7, On the first day of the week we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were men, many lamps in the upper room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. What a story. Uh, 
from tragedy to comedy, and there's all kinds of little things in this story that are a little bit strange. Well, it begins with the fact that they're going to stay seven days in Troas, and apparently they're waiting for the next boat to arrive. Well, the sixth day of the seven happens to be a Sunday, the first day of the week. So Paul decides to join the Christians at Troas in a worship service. And it's a worship service that includes celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, There may have been a community meal and Paul giving a very, very long sermon. Uh, So it gives us a little bit of insight about how they celebrated church in the first century. And this is one of the earliest indications that Christians celebrated, went to church on a Sunday. Uh, Those who were Jewish used to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, which would, would have been a Saturday. But now we find Christians celebrating, worshiping on a Sunday. Why a Sunday, the first day of the week? It's Resurrection Day. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday, the first day of the week. So every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. It's a reminder every Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why Christians worship on Sunday. So they meet, uh, they break bread. Paul's going to leave the next day. So he just keeps on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Uh, Luke wants to paint a picture of somebody getting tired and drowsy. It's a warm spring evening. They've just had a nice meal that somebody cooked. There are many lamps inside this room uh, which are burning up the oxygen supply. And there's a speaker who keeps talking and talking and talking. So Luke kind of sets up this whole thing. And seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus. Uh, It's a three-story building. Uh, Windows back then did not have glass, you know, like we do. So, you know, you could just go right over the edge. Uh, Eutychus, a young man, probably 10 to 17 years old. Yeah, probably he goes to the window just to get some fresh air. I'm sure with all the lamps, it's after midnight. It's getting stuffy in there. He needs a little fresh air. Maybe he's already a little sleepy. Uh, most people back in the first century, as soon as the sun came up, they got up and went to work. So it's after midnight. Uh, we're talking 18 hours ago, maybe when he got up. So he's quite sleepy. And he slips into this deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Uh, I, Luke was there. And Luke's thing, Paul just keeps talking and talking. Yeah, it reminds me when I went to Belize. On a Sunday night when I thought I was speaking, I wasn't. Uh, there were, we went to church and we had a speaker. You know, we sang and we had a speaker and I'm going, great, we're done. <laughs> there was another speaker after the first speaker. And then there were some testimonies and some other things. Church started about 7, and I think we left about 11. Uh, and, and we left, they were still going strong. <laughs> you know, you know, but that's four hours, <laughs> and we're not used to that. You know, an hour, we're done in America. You know, But you know, four hours of church, and I was going, yeah, I kind of relate to this. And so Paul kept talking on and on. The young man falls asleep, apparently loses his balance, falls to the ground from the third story, and they pick him up dead. And we're thinking at that point, what a horrible story that this would happen. Uh, And so how is Paul going to respond to all of that in verse 10? Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him and said, don't be alarmed, he's alive. So Luke portrays this as a resurrection, a recitation story. Uh, The young boy died, Paul throws himself on top of the young man, and the next thing you know, the young man is alive again. Of course, Jesus performed resurrection miracles, Lazarus being the most 
uh, known. Uh, Simon Peter brought Dorcas back to life. But this story is most similar to stories of Elijah and Elisha. Both raised a young man back to life by throwing themselves on top of the dead person and basically covering them up. And then the next thing you know, the person who had died was alive once again. So now we've got a good story. The young man's alive again. And, and you would think they would just all go home after that. You know, we've had enough excitement for one day. We're just going to call it a day and go home. That's not what happens. Verse 11, after all this happens, Paul goes back upstairs, has a midnight snack, and continues to talk until the sun comes up the next day. I mean, and you're laughing because I'm laughing too. Uh, this is comedy. Uh, the fact that Paul just performed a miracle of resurrection and you'd think everybody would just go home and breathe a sigh of relief, but no, he's got to continue talking until the sun comes up. You know, a normal application of this passage for preachers, is don't give long sermons because people will fall asleep and hurt themselves. But I've never heard a preacher give that application before. And certainly not Paul. <laughs> he raises the kid from the dead and then goes on talking for another six hours. So, And then what about the young man? Well, they took the young man home alive and they were greatly comforted. Not only that, they were encouraged. Uh, they saw God do something incredible. Uh, it's a story that they would repeat, I'm sure, again and again and again. Well, that's Paul's ministry at Troas. Let me wrap things up with the journey to Miletus. Uh, it says we, and again, Luke is right there. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. And again, back to the map. Uh, Troas is right up there, and Asos is just a few miles from there. And there's two ways to get there. Uh, you could walk, and Paul does, or you could simply take a boat around the Aegean Sea. Uh, for some reason, everybody goes by boat except Paul, uh, and not sure why, Luke doesn't explain why, uh, but that was the plan, that uh, everybody else would take the boat and Paul would walk, which he does. When he met us at Asos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene, which again was just a little seaport town. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off uh, Kios. The next day after that, we crossed over to Samos, and on the following day arrived at Miletus. And again, Luke is with him, and Luke apparently has his little travel journal, and he's writing down all the little seaport towns that they visit. It takes about five days to make that journey from Troas to Miletus. Uh, Miletus is where the next story is going to take place. So they arrive at Miletus, and Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. He's already missed Passover. Now he's shooting for Pentecost. Paul decides to skip Ephesus. And if I go back on the map, from Asos... He could have stopped at Ephesus. There was, a, there was a seaport there. But he bypasses it and ends up in Miletus. And the question becomes, why skip Ephesus? Now, he left after an uproar in the town. And Luke doesn't give us a lot of information. Uh, there could have been more opposition to Paul in Ephesus uh, than Luke records. And so not only was Paul in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, but there could have been trouble in Ephesus if he had stopped again. Because if Paul was in such a hurry 
Why does he do what he does in the next verse, verse 17? In verse 17, he invites the elders, the church leaders, from the church at Ephesus to meet him in Miletus. In other words, Paul isn't going to them. He wants them to come to him in Miletus, which is 30 miles away. And back then, travel was slow. I mean, today, piece of cake. Back then, five days. Because Paul has to land in Miletus, send a messenger 30 miles to Ephesus to tell the elders that Paul wants to meet with you. So he has to gather them up, round them up, then bring them the 30 miles to Miletus. And scholars estimate that takes about five days. So why, if Paul is in such a hurry... Does he, in essence, waste five days in order to talk to these people once again? And because of that, many scholars feel that it's not just a time factor in Ephesus. There could be trouble in Ephesus. And Luke doesn't always tell us all the trouble that Paul gets in. Uh, in fact, Luke often only records the good stuff of Paul's ministry. Uh, Luke often doesn't record the persecution that Paul encounters. In 2 Corinthians, Paul gives a list of all the times he was persecuted and all that he went through. And you won't find most of those in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke just simply doesn't record them. In fact, there's only one time that Paul is persecuted by the Roman government, and that's in Philippi. And Luke makes the point that he was illegally persecuted. As a Roman citizen, his rights were violated. Uh, and that was part of the point. Don't violate the rights of Christians. And that was one of Luke's main points in writing this book. So he's on his way to Jerusalem. But he's going to stop at Miletus. And at Miletus, he's going to give a speech. And next week, we're going to take a look at that speech. It's in the rest of chapter 20. As he explains his plans to the elders at Ephesus, and the elders of Ephesus are going to respond to Paul's plans. And they're going to have a discussion about what is the right thing to do. Well, tonight, we've learned that we can have great plans, but God can interrupt those plans. God can change those plans. God can have a better plan than what we have. So whenever we make plans, leave room for God. He just might have something different in mind for us.